I'd like to talk about the web today. Um, uh, I guess, like, first of all, sorry, introduction. Uh, my name's Aaron. I'm the CEO of Rossi Corp. We make Replicash and Reflect. They're two sync engines that web application developers use to like, bring some of the benefits of local first to classic web apps. Um, and yeah, what I want to talk about is the web. Uh, in case you haven't noticed, it is, it is rough out there on the web. Uh, it is super complicated. Like, it is insanely hard to build a decent web app. Um, and so many web developers like, all across the spectrum are trying to figure out, like, why is this this way? And like, what can we do to fix it? Um, and you know, we're here at the Local First Conference, so I think like, we all know the answer, right? It's sync. Right? We use sync engines, and uh, that just fixes it, right? Um, and sync, it does have like, a lot of advantages. Um, you know, with sync, you get that instantaneous UI response, where anything you tap responds right away. You get um, automatic reactivity, where someone clicks on something, someone does something, and every other user sees it. Um, and you get like, a really nice developer experience, much, much better than like, classic API-based uh, web apps. But I just have to ask one problem, or one question. Um, if sync is the answer to the web's complexity problems, like, where are the apps? Because like, sync is not a new idea. Um, we've had sync engines for a long time. Like, Quora was on a sync engine in 2010. Meteor was the first open source sync engine in 2011. Even Linear, which you know, we may as well call this Linear Conference, um, was uh, you know, five years ago, six years ago. Um, so it does seem like Sync has the tools to solve these problems, but like, something is going wrong. Um, it, they're not being adopted widely. Um, and as someone who loves the web, like, I want to know why that is. Um, at Rossi Corp, we have been helping developers adopt Sync uh, for the past four years. Um, and so we've had the opportunity to hear a lot of things, challenges that they've hit, um, and, and problems that they've had integrated sync into their apps. And, um, and it really comes down to, I think it comes down to like a few core things. Um, number one, it is often not possible for developers to sync all of a user's data onto the device. Like, it, more often than you'd, than you'd expect, like, at least half of the serious um, customers that we have have this problem. Um, and we do have partial sync in our products in, in Replicash, uh, but people find them too difficult to use. It's hard for them to know what data to sync. Um, so I'm going to give a few examples of this, because I think this might be kind of counterintuitive. Um, the first one is Vercel. Uh, Vercel is one of our biggest customers. Um, they use uh, Replicash to build this comment feature. Uh, if you're not familiar with Vercel, they, they have this feature where you push a PR to your GitHub, and you get a live preview of that PR, and you can see that PR lot. You can see all the changes that PR introduces live. And they've added this commenting feature to that, where that's what the video is showing there, where you can leave comments on the PR. You can mark it up and say, like, make this bigger or whatever. And um, they use Replicash for this and to get that really great user experience. And you might see this feature, and you think, like, well, that's not very much data. Clearly, this is something that can be done with the sync engine. You can sync that data to the client. But um, one thing that we have found at Rossi Corp is like, when something works well, it gets used a lot. Um, like, so we gave this tool to Vercel, and they made this, um, they made this feature with it, um, and it works really well. And so some of their customers just like, use the crap out of this feature. You know, most of the customers, they leave a few comments. They, you know, it's a reasonable amount of data. But they have some customers that have you know, thousands of comments on a PR. And so it gets to the point where it does affect page load. Um, so we have partial sync in Replicash. We um, check in the time. <laughs> I don't want to get gonged. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, what was I saying? Um, we, we, we have partial sync in Replicash. Uh, we have leveraged that to um, split up the data that's synced into chunks. And so you go to one PR, you sync the data for that. You go to a different PR, you sync the data for that. And that seems fine, but then something else happened. Vercel like this feature so much that they put it on their live Next.js docs for the whole world. So instead of you know, just like the, the users within an org that were commenting, suddenly it was like the entire world who was commenting. Um, and not only that, like PR, the design of our like, partitioning that we implemented for them was meant for like, how long a PR would be up, which isn't very long, like a few days, a week, right? But the Next.js docs were up for like a year. So it was like several orders of magnitude more users and you know, another order of magnitude more time. 
Um, so the partitioning scheme that we designed just like went out the window. Um, and you might be saying like, well, I'm not building a, a commenting feature, I'm building a more traditional application, um, so this doesn't apply to me. So then my question will be like, well, okay, what about GitHub? Like, is, is GitHub a thing that should be buildable with sync engines? And I would say, yes, it is. Like, in fact, probably all of us would like that if that were true. Um, and, and so then my question will be, well, okay, like, let's take the main GitHub issue UI, and my question is, what data should we sync to build this UI? And before you answer, Consider the fact that this repo that I have on the screen is the Kubernetes repo, and it is not the repo with the most issues. It's actually the fifth biggest repo, um, and it has, at least forget, 45,000 issues. Um, that total to about 200 megabytes of data. So the question is, what should we sync in order to render this? Should we sync all the data? Should we sync a subset of it? I would argue that we should definitely not sync all the data, because you know, like think about people on phones, right? Like you could argue, okay, if I work on Kubernetes, I can have all the data on my device, and that's fine, that makes sense. But like if I'm navigating in to this repo from like some link on the outside web and I'm not a develop I'm not a member of Kubernetes, like should I have to wait to download 200 megs of data to view this? Obviously not. Um, so then the question is, well, if I'm not gonna download all the data, what data will I sync? Um, and you might say, just you know, some subset. But the problem is that this UI has all these, you, you notice it has all these drop downs. You can pick you know, to filter by creator, you can filter by label, you can filter by, I don't know what else, uh, author. Um, and obviously, those filters have to work over the entire data set. So syncing just a subset of the data set won't work either. And then you could say, well, OK, search isn't meant for sync engines. Like, you have to use something else to do search. But then my point would be, well, this whole UI is search. Like, there's nothing else on it. So that would just mean that we can't build this with, with sync engines, and that's not acceptable either. Um, so this is like an instance of a, I could cite like dozens of examples like this of customers that we have spoken to, but the, my general like takeaway from this has been that <clears throat> clients, like sync engines are examples of caches, and just like all other caches, like it doesn't make sense to cache everything you get 80% of the value from 20% of the data, and you actually don't want to sync 100% because every additional byte that you sync has a linear cost um, and, a, and, and like a decreasing value. So what's the answer? Like, um, sync engines do seem like they address many of the complexity problems of the web, um, but you can't sync everything, and it's hard to know what to sync. What should we do? All right, so what if you could just write queries? Like, what if you didn't have to worry about what data is sync? Just express the data you want as a query. Just express what you're trying to display. Um, OK, thanks. Um, like, why is this something that, as a developer, I have to even worry about? You know, why do I have to manage what data gets synced? You know, this seems like a job for a computer. This is what we're working on next at Rossi Corp. Uh, we call it Zero. Um, it's the next iteration of Replicash and Reflect. It's built on, on Replicash. And the core idea is that you don't think about the data that you want to sync. You don't really think about sync at all. You instead think in terms of queries. You express the data that you want to pull onto the device in, in the form of a query, and you have the full power of SQL at your disposal. Joins, aggregates, subselects, everything. Um, and you just write your application in terms of these queries, and zero um, syncs the up to 100 megabytes of data onto the device, and it manages this cache itself. Um, keeping like the most commonly used data on the device and available. Um, we call this architecture um, hybrid search, and it provides a number of advantages. Um, you get 99% of user interactions instantly. And I say 99% on purpose, because 1% you don't get instantly, and that's actually a feature, uh, because it enables you to use zero with applications having any amount of data. So you're not limited by the amount of data that you can fit on the dice, device or what is practical to download. Um, you, of course, get automatic reactivity because it is a sync engine. You get uh, the dramatically better DX that comes with sync engines. Um, and like at a bigger level, you get generality. Um, this is a general purpose tool that can be used to build any web application. Any place where you use databases and APIs today, you can use zero tomorrow, and you can get um, the benefits of sync. Um, I'm going to skip this. This is the architecture, but we're running out of time. Who wants to see a demo? OK, who wants to cross their fingers regarding network? <laughs>
why do I always do live demos? It's like the worst idea. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so we build a linear. Um, <laughs> it's like a rite of passage that like every one of these tools has to build a linear. Um, but we actually started the trend, or, or I don't know, I'm not sure if that's true, but two years ago when we built Replicash, we, we also built a linear. Um, and at the time, we wanted to be super ambitious. That's me. I, only two years ago, I looked so much younger. Um, <laughs> and uh, we wanted to be super ambitious with that, and so we put the entire React issue repository into it, which was at the time 11,000 issues, about 50 megabytes of data. This time, we wanted to, be, we wanted to really show that there's no limit to the amount of data that you can address with this system. And so we wanted to be much more ambitious, so we put 20 times as much data into it, a full gigabyte um, of over 200,000 issues and 2 million comments. So it's the world's most ridiculous issue repository. Um, and uh, yeah, as you can see, it's uh, totally local first. Um, everything <clears throat> responds completely instantly. It has the like, you know, zero millisecond update that everyone loves about sync. Um, everything is optimistic. Um, but like this, obviously, we can't download a gigabyte of data into the device. That's the whole point here. So this doesn't actually do that. It's instead downloading, I think this has about 25 megabytes in the UI, in the client. Um, and specifically, what, it, what we've synced is like the first like 5,000 issues of every one of the sorts that, that the app can do. So I can sort here, it, it sorts instantly. Um, and every one of these sorts we've, we've sorted about, we've synced about 10,000 issues. And then when you do a filter, um, what's actually happening, I mean, it appears instant, but what's happening is that you're getting a local filter over the data that has been synced to the device. And, and then in parallel, um, the, a, 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 a message is going to the server, and we are also doing the search on the server and syncing the data from that. Um, so usually you can't see it, right? Because 100 megabytes of data is like a lot. So in almost all cases, you know, anything that you, you know, do in here, it's going to be hitting the local cache. Um, so again, 99% of the time, you're never going to observe um, a, a, a server message. But if you do like a really um, you know, obscure search, um, like say we search for like um, active uh, issues, and we'll do like ones that are urgent and involve uh, black hole. Oops, black hole. Um, that's our little loading indicator right there, and and we get server results. Um, and so this happens automatically. Every single query that you do in Zero has this behavior where you get local results instantly, and then you get server results um, asynchronously. Um, of course, it's, it's reactive because it's a sync engine. Um, what else did I want to show? Um, so like when you, build, when, you, when you build a sync engine that has this kind of um, hybrid query system, a number of cool things fall out of it. Um, like, first of all, it scales to any amount of, of data. But the other thing is that you can get instant page loads um, because the system is designed to run queries against the local cache first and then fall back to the server. And because of that, like you can imagine if you're loading a page from the very beginning and there's nothing cached, then like it will just attempt to, to run the query against the local cache, so there'll be nothing, and then you get server results. And so it will have the same behavior as a classic like SPA app in terms of performance. Um, and then it will just start like syncing in the background. So like if I um, clear all the data that's in this thing. Um, and reload, it loads pretty fast. I mean, this is localhost, so it's a little bit cheating. But like, remember, there's like a gigabyte of data in this. So there, there's 200,000 issues, you know? So that is still like pretty amazingly fast. Um, and especially if you've worked on these kind of technologies, you know that there's, as you get more and more data into it, it really severely affects page load. Um, and the same thing happens like anywhere in the app. Um, so like, imagine that use case where someone is navigating into the issue from out on the internet. It's a public, you know, there's a public view to this, and they're not a member of the Kubernetes repo. And you know, so they have no cache, and they navigate in here, and it loads instantly. And then it just starts syncing in the background. Um, and like, you know, I say instant. It's obviously not as fast as like SSR. You know, like, um, you, but the, the interesting thing is that we could actually even support SSR with this, with this technology, because um, 
because it's designed to run against an empty cache, you can just, on the server, run it and set the cache to be zero size. Um, and then it will render as normal. It will do the, you know, the network request, it will render, and then it goes to the server or to the client, and you can even pick it up. So if you want to support things like um, um, you know, server rendering for like crawlers and bots and things like that, it just works naturally. Thanks. Um, <laughs> so, um, so I, the one thing I really like about this, like um, when yeah, when React came out, um, there, like people loved the like component-based design. Uh, I was like really impacted by React. I I just like loved the the design of it, and the reactive rendering was amazing. But there was this question like right from the beginning, like the first day of React, of like, where does the business logic go? And, and like, where does the other code go? Where does the state management go? Where does the um, uh, data fetching go? And, and like, it's been 11 years now, and like, there's still no answer. Like, people are still asking, like, where does that code go? Um, and I think like, that kind of exposed something interesting. Um, because like, when, we, when we add sync to the equation, um, data fetching and state management just get abstracted away. And this is true for all sync engines. Um, and then all that's left is like the business logic, and that can just go inside the components. So it provides this like really nice like way to work. And I, all the speakers have have brought this up um, for for their own tools, and it's the same for all of them. Like, but you end up with this model where it's it's entirely component based. You build your UI out of components. You query data in the component. You reactively render it. You respond to events. You write it back to the data model, and that's it. And like, it's just a really like beautiful way to work. And with zero, you can build this kind of application um, without having to fit into the traditional constraints of, um, of synced applications. Um, when I've shown this to people like in the past, um, I some, sometimes get this, this um, question or I sometimes get this comment about it being too good to be true. And like, uh, it, is, it is like a really hard thing to build. Like these hybrid queries are the kind of the hardest way to build this. Um, and we avoided trying to do this for a while. Um, but like, the more I play with it and, and the more I think about what the web could be like um, with this pervasively available, um, the more I feel like it's just inevitable. It's inevitable. Like, um, like it's going to happen, and, like, um, and, and like it's, it's you know, not too good to be true. It's too good to not become true. Um, so yeah, um, we were working on this. We started in like, February of this year. Um, we're working towards a summer release um, of the source, um, and we're going to do this as an open project. Previously, our projects have been closed source for a variety of reasons. They're client-side only tools, so it's like hard, harder to open source them and make a business out of it. Um, but this is going to be a, an open project. Um, this feels like way too big of a thing for like one company to do, um, and we're hoping to build like a community of people who want to help work on this um, and who want to become involved in it. Um, we're working towards a beta end of year, um, and we don't have early access available right now, but you can sign up to a mailing list if you're interested um, at zerosync.dev. Um, this is the new focus of um, Rossi Corp. Like, we are still going to, we're going to open source Replicash and Reflect, um, and we will still support it, but this feels like where all of our work has been going um, over the past years and, like, and what we should be working on. Um, and so we think that almost all users of Replicash will be able to transition to this. And we do have stickers available. So find uh, me or Eric, um, and, uh, and, and we'd be happy to give you a sticker. Thank you. <laughs>